I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. Hi, I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. Billy, we have everything from invasive plants to wildlife to trees to felling, to you name it, we've got it. I know it's a really great program today. I'm so excited you are with us today. Um, we do have some heavy hitters today. So um, sit back, get your coffee or a glass of tea or water and enjoy the show. Um, first up, we're going to have um, Dr. Ellen Crocker and um, she's going to be talking about some invasive plants we need to be on the lookout for. And, um, you know, this is something, Renee, that we always need to be vigilant of, but this time of year is especially important. Um, and then we have a, a return guest, Kai Davis, grad student here in our department. He did a segment a couple of months ago and it was outstanding and it was so popular and we asked him to come back and we're going to try to get him to look at some wildlife sounds that maybe he could hear us out there and see if people know um, what's going on with that and then we have our very own Chad Nyman he's going to be talking about woodland safety equipment and felling resources um, Chad works with the uh, primary industry um, so basically from that log all the way to getting into a board so Chad knows all about that stuff so he's going to be talking about that stuff and then um, we're going to have a little quick wrap up on some upcoming programs you know the summer is one of our busier programming as far as like our field programs um, going on. So we'll be talking about those upcoming programs. But thank you all for being with us. If you have questions, um, use the chat function via Zoom. And if you're on Facebook Live, use the comment section. But Renee, I'm excited about today's show. I am too. So Ellen, let's get started if you want to pop on. And uh, oh no, we've got new invasives. Is that what you're telling me? As we needed some yes. more. Yes, <laughs> I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but there are new invasive plants that um, I'm hoping everyone watching today can be on the lookout for. So while we never want to see these new invasives, um, you know, that's just a part of life. There's always new invasive species, new invasive insects, invasive pathogens, invasive mm -hmm. plants like we're talking about today. And the sooner you can uh, see them, identify them, manage them, the better your chances are that you can, you know, go from stop what's just like one little plant, um, you know, you can get rid of it, no problem, versus a whole sea of these invasives uh, to kind of be on the lookout for. So today I'm going to be talking about um, a couple new ones. And by new, I mean really, really new. Like these have only been detected uh, once in in Kentucky, but are in some of our neighboring states. You and really so, <laughs> yeah, so you probably don't see any of these. You probably won't have any of these, at least I hope. Um, and if you do, I really want you to report them and share that with people because then we might be able to manage them, might be able to eradicate them. Um, that's a lot easier than trying to do it once it's all over. Um, so hopefully you can see my slides. And these are the two plants we'll be talking about today, Java water dropwort and mile a minute wheat. So this is the first one that I want you with your eagle eyes out there in the field to be on the lookout for. And that's Java dropwort. Um, it goes by many, many different names. So some people will call it Java water dropwort. Some people might call it just water dropwort or Java dropwort or Vietnamese parsley, Japanese parsley, water celery, so many different names for this species. Um, but it's not native to North America. It's native to Asia and it's part of the carrot family. So if you look at this, you might look at this picture and think, huh, I think I've seen things like this before. And you certainly have, you know, we have many other species, both native and non-native in this carrot family, but I'm going to show you a few more pictures of it and some video that'll hopefully help you pick it out and recognize it as something different if you happen to see it. Um, so it really likes super wet areas. That's something, you know, to note about this species um, is that it likes the standing water. You might see it in a place uh, with a lot of water. And again, you can see these leaves growing very densely, uh, unlike some of our other species. And another thing to note about it is that it has these uh, 
umbels of flowers, these little collections of flowers, much like many of the other plants in the carrot family that we have around here. Um, so these white uh, kind of flower clusters, and of course the um, uh, carrot-like leaves as well that we've got uh, right here. Um, so uh, just kind of something else to keep in mind is that we do have other plants that can look kind of similar. So you know, just because you see something that's kind of like this isn't necessarily a cause to really be concerned, but I do encourage you to post it online and check with other people because they can let you know. Um, and just kind of if you wonder where did this come from? How did we get this plant here all the way from Asia? There's a number of good reasons. So first off, it's uh, sometimes used ornamentally. So the, here's a picture of a variegated variety uh, that can be sold um, commercially. Just because it's pretty does not mean you want it in your landscape, though, because it won't stay put there. And if it gets out, it can get out of control. Um, it's also uh, really valued, um, you know, from a culinary perspective in many different cultures. So when I looked online for this species, I found several different dishes that are prepared uh, with the plant. Plant. Um, but I would caution you that just because this plant is edible, there are other plants in that same carrot family that are edible, as well as some that are definitely not. Uh, so something you don't want to confuse. And here's a map of where it is now. And you can see that Kentucky is a little white spot on the map, like it's not there yet. Oh, but wait just a minute. Just a few weeks ago when we had our City Nature Challenge, which is a great citizen science event where people report the diversity of different species in different areas, uh, one observant person uh, noticed this plant where they were in the Louisville area and took some pictures of it. And fortunately, some other really observant people uh, on iNaturalist, which is where this data was collected, um, said, you know what, that doesn't look like any of our native uh, plants. I think that might be this invasive plant. And because this is a really new species to us, uh, it's really important to know where it is. So if you see something, I'm asking you all to report it, but also uh, we don't have lots of it yet. Um, so we wanted to share with you a really short video from someone uh, uh, who is in an area with a lot more of this species. So Billy has a short video that he's going to share of what to look for when you're looking for uh, Java water drop. So this is Java dropwort. Uh, Ananthe javanica. Sometimes it's called Java water drop wort, although lots of things are called drop wort, and some of those are very, very poisonous. Uh, Chinese celery, Indian pennywort, water celery, all sorts of names. It's, um, uh, it's a plant that's, uh, that's in the carrot family. Um, you can see it's got the, the flat uh, flower tops, what they call umbels, flat on top, a bunch of little florets all put together, which is typical of the carrot family, and most of them are white much like Queensland's lace and wild carrots would be. Um, this is unfortunately a nasty invasive species. This was brought over from, uh, from well, it's, it's native to Asia and, and Australia, um, India, so forth. And it's been brought over, unfortunately, and sometimes deliberately planted in our, um, in our wetlands, uh, most, mostly for culinary reasons by um, mostly uh, Asian cultures. And while it is uh, supposedly, I mean, many, many of the um, uh, plants in the carrot family, parsley family, are edible, like carrots and parsley, um, dill. But other ones, such as poison hemlock uh, and so forth, are extremely dangerous. In fact, poison hemlock would be the most poisonous plant that we have in, um, in North America, and it's what, uh, you know, what killed off uh, Socrates. Um, th so this plant, unfortunately, uh, was released here, and it is a very edible plant. It's uh, considered a delicacy in some things, particularly in Japanese uh, and some da Japanese festivals. But Java drop wort, which is an aquatic plant, you see it's growing here on the edge of this, uh, the edge of this wetland, um, can just take off. You can see how it's already covering this small patch. And then after it does so, it'll continue to spread um, throughout the moist areas around the edge. So something that we really do not like to see in any of our uh, parks uh, this we're going to have to get rid of, we're going to have to destroy, um, and hopefully, it, I don't see any more of it, so I'm hoping that we have it under control right here, and that this particular Java dropboard pet colony is here, and that's all we're going to get.
Great. So thank you, Billy, for sharing that video. And, um, you know, again, the message here is just if you see something, say something, right, with uh, Java water dropwort or other species, because um, we don't want it to establish here. And so in addition to that species, another, another new invasive plant that I want you to be on the lookout for this summer um, is mile a minute weed. And so here you can see a photo of this plant really different from the one we just discussed, which is going to be that herbaceous species that's in those more wetland areas or ripe Parian areas, mile a minute weed is a vine. And you can see kind of that vine growth here, but you can certainly see it in this picture. It is kind of taking over this whole hillside and growing really, really densely. This is all that mile a minute weed. Um, and it can form these really dense uh, carpets that can overtop other plant communities, uh, kind of reducing the diversity there, and in our woodland context, uh, suppressing regeneration of trees. So you're not going to see your seedlings growing into bigger seeds or bigger trees if they're just covered with this mile a minute weed. Um, so something that's very distinctive about mile a minute weed, um, as you start to scout for it, is that it has these very uh, uh, unwelcomed downward curved thorns on the stems. So you can see them right here. There are these kind of recurved thorns. And if you're trying to pull it up, let me tell you, uh, you will notice this because they can definitely prick you. And it's something you're gonna be, want to wear gloves if you see it to pull it up um, because those thorns are quite distinctive. Um, a few other things to note about it as you're scouting around, its leaves have this really distinctive triangular shape. Um, especially on the underside, uh, they have this very light green color, and the upper surface is uh, slightly darker, but still light green color. Um, and these are the fruits of mile a minute weed. You wouldn't really notice the flowers. There's nothing too showy about the, them, but the berries are kind of distinctive because they have this uh, beautiful pastel uh, color and kind of come in different colors. They turn this metallic blue over time. Um, but definitely not something you want uh, to see those berries really stick out and they can help to disperse mile a minute weed um, either floating through water or on contaminated soil or equipment uh, is going to be the way that they're most readily moved to a new location. Um, so where is mile a minute weed right now? Well, if you were to look at a map, you'd see, oh, there's none in Kentucky, right? But the reason why I want you all to be on the lookout for it is that last year, kind of similar to what happened uh, with uh, the species we just discussed, is that someone posted a picture on iNaturalist that looked a little suspicious, right? This is this is not something that we normally have occurring here, but they were curious about what it was. And they also posted it um, on the Kentucky Native Plant Society page. Um, and I think this is great because as soon as they posted this, people could say, wait a minute, you have this invasive plant. Uh, we know, can we help you get rid of it? And sure enough, uh, myself and colleagues at the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves and with the Kentucky Invasive Plant Council corresponded with this landowner, uh, found the patch that they had observed and helped them remove it. So here you can see some different folks pulling that invasive vine out of the bushes that it was growing in. And you can see them wearing gloves because, right, those thorns are not fun, uh, pulling that out and bagging it up. So you can see those vines and the tiny kind of metallic blue berries that would be the start of next year's infestation if they didn't get them. Um, so bagging up all of those plants that we could find, scouting the area. And um, here you can see my technician, uh, Lee Grace, with a lot of bags of uh, mile a minute 
vine. And so I think the, the moral of this story is if you see something, say something. So here's a photo of those great landowners who, you know, were curious about what that was, reported it online, and then through their proactive uh, work, you know, were able to eradicate that locally. It's nowhere else, and we really don't know how it got there, but we don't want it to spread from there out into other areas. So if you see some new invasive species or just something you're kind of concerned about, I encourage you to say something either to your local county agent or your forester or use the technology that's at your fingertips to report it online. If you're reporting a new invasive species, the great news is that will connect you to a network of other people who can help you from there. So whether it's mile a minute or Let's say it could be a different invasive species. This is spotted lanternfly, an invasive insect that we don't want to see in Kentucky. Um, if you see something, uh, do use iNaturalist and other tools to report this. So if you haven't used iNaturalist before, I really recommend you download the app to your phone and make an account. You can also visit it online on their website, iNaturalist.org. But the great thing about iNaturalist is that you can use it a variety of different ways. You can use it to help you with identification um, and to report species. So here's a short video where I you know, just opened my app and you can just take a picture of something. In this case, it's an invasive plant that I don't wanna see winter creeper and it will kind of provide an automatic identification of what that might be. So it's gonna suggest some different species but right there at the top is the invasive species that I don't want to see. So not only is it great for identifying things, but when you ob observe that, it will share that with a broader community and can alert people to the presence of new invasives. You can also use iNaturalist to look at other observations in your area and beyond, you know, see what people are noticing all over. Um, so I really recommend that as a tool. And I really encourage all of you to get out there and observe. And if you see anything unusual, you know, it's much better to be safe than sorry. I would rather get uh, lots of emails about things that aren't these invasive, new invasives we don't want to see uh, than to miss them. And if you're interested in learning more about Java Water Drop Org, I'm going to drop in the chat this really great um, uh, story map that was created about it um, and kind of walks you through more of that identification. And a big thank you to the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. Uh, they're the ones who first kind of noticed uh, that um, observation and tried to connect um, finding more observations of Java water drop wart in the area. So lots of great partners um, locally to assist if you have any questions. Well, we do have one question that came through. It said, it seems like there's a lot of invasive or non-native species in our area that originate in East Coast ports. So is there, uh, what's being done to prevent this from happening? I think that's a really good point in that, um, you know, the easiest way to stop new invasives from being a problem is to prevent them from arriving to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. And if we could somehow know which species are going to be invaders and which ones aren't, um, it would be a lot easier. But sometimes it's really hard to tell that uh, until it's too late. Correct. So there are a lot of regulations for the import of uh, new species, but and there are you know, restrictions on those that that are known to be damaging, um, but sometimes we might not know that. And especially with something that's being used in that kind of culinary perspective as well, it can be really hard uh, to mm. have something that it's not that it doesn't have any value, it's just that it's a big problem when it escapes uh, that cultivated setting. And so I think unfortunately we just have so much movement, so much global movement that it's gonna be really hard to prevent um, some of these introductions, uh, which is why I think it's so important to find things early when they do arrive. Um, even if we, you know, only miss a tiny, tiny fraction of them, uh, that tiny fraction can still cause a big problem when it gets here. Um, so fortunately, there are some great uh, national organizations that are doing their best to try to prevent the arrival of new things. Um, but, but certainly, I don't think that's going to be a solution long term, because uh, there's just so much global movement happening.
I was going to say, Ellen, and so many, I mean, they're looking through, you know, everything that comes across, but there's a lot of things sneak by that, you know, that they didn't intend. You know, you think about the emerald ash borer and the coming in on the pallets, and you think about some of our amphibious things that come in through the water or ballast. And, and mean, with our invasive plants, so many of them were first introduced horticulturally, so it wasn't even an accident. It was something that, you know, we thought this was going to be a great idea, but, uh, you know, in retrospect, uh, it didn't turn out the way that people thought. Um, and unfortunately, there does tend to be a lag time there in terms of when something is first introduced and when it's noted to be a problem. And of course, we've seen that time and time again with lots of different invasive plants. Um, uh, so, you know, definitely moving forward, it's something to, to be thinking about. Well, and I think, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say that's why what you're doing, Ellen, is so important, right? You're helping us, you know, be aware of these things and getting people out there looking for them. So I can't thank you enough for all you do for try to keep Kentucky's forests as healthy as possible. Well, thanks for having me on, but. I encourage everyone watching to get out there and, you know, be looking for different things and reporting those because we never know what we'll see next. Um, but with your eyes on the ground, we're a lot better off. No doubt. I was just wondering between kudzu and mile a minute, which one would win? <laughs> <laughs> Let's not find out. Yeah. I know, exactly. <laughs> race we want to see, yeah. No, I don't want that race. No, thank you, Renee. <laughs> I know. Uh, thank you, Ellen. We appreciate Dr. Crocker, it. appreciate you as always. Thank you. Uh, Oh, All right. So now we've got some uh, what's that sound coming up. So we have Kai Davis coming on if you can get on with us. And uh, thank you for joining us today. Hey, there nice you go. To you, <laughs> you too. So what what are your segments going to be about today? Yeah. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Well, actually, yeah, I can just do a little introduction. So yeah, I'm going to be doing wildlife sounds. Um, and then we're going to be talking about bird sounds in particular. So um, I'm a master student here at UK and part of my project is looking at birds. So I'm learning bird calls, so I might as well share them with you all. Well. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, yeah. So I've decided this is my first time doing this and I've decided that I want to do a theme for each time I come on and I'll do it based on color. So today's color is going to be blue. So why not start with UK colors? Obviously, right? Yeah, obviously. That it's is my favorite color to too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so then we're going to talk about two birds today. So one is going to be a migratory bird that we'll find based on the season that, I, that we're in currently that I'm talking about. So obviously springtime in May. Um, but then also uh, looking at local, a local bird that you should find year round as well. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of my talk right now. Wonderful. Cool. Let's get at it. Yeah. So as today is the blue day, uh, that's my background for, for the day. So let's go ahead and dive in. So uh, this is the first bird. It's going to be a local bird. Um, I'll go ahead and play this. Oh, and then feel free to, if you, if you know what it is, feel free to post in the chat. Uh, that will make it a little bit more fun for me, but I will definitely reveal it in a second. So this is kind of going to be the habitat that you'll find this bird in. Um, and I already gave you one clue. It is going to be a, a blue colored bird. Um, so yeah, I'll go ahead and introduce what this bird is. It is a blue jay. Um, so if you did know that, kudos to yourself. I don't know. If you were just a little too slow at typing, uh, that's totally okay. I trust that you knew it. Um, but anyway, this blue jay call is going to sound like a jeer jeer or a jay jay call. Um, and then sometimes they can mimic other calls and they'll even mimic a call of a hawk. Even. It's really interesting. Um, so with that, um, it's, it kind of shows their intelligence too um, and why they would do that. So if they're mimicking a hawk, sometimes they'll use that to signal to other birds or other uh, blue jays that there may be a hawk present or to scare off other birds so that they can get some food at a bird feeder or something like that. So really intelligent birds is really interesting. So let's learn a little bit more about the blue jay too. So we can dive into its life history. Um, so like I said, they're known for their intelligence and their social systems, as well as their tight family bonds. Uh, they have a mate for life and they'll travel with that social mate throughout the year. Um, they communicate with others both vocally and using body language, which is really interesting. So the body language that they'll use is they'll use their crest to kind of display how they're feeling. So the higher their, their crest, the higher their aggression level or the more um, 
anxious they are. Uh, but then the lower their crest, the more comfortable they are, the lower their um, aggression level is going to be. So it's really interesting. Uh, so in terms of their diet, um, you can find uh, fruits, uh, nuts, and even insects. So it's really interesting to see uh, how omnivorous they are. Uh, so they actually really prefer acorns. That seems to be their favorite, which is very interesting. But they'll also eat on um, small, injured, or dead vertebrates, as well as dying adult birds. So they'll pretty much go after anything if it's an opportunity. Um, and then also they can carry nuts in their uh, golar pouch is what it's called. It's kind of like their upper esophagus. And they can carry about like two to three nuts in there. Um, and it's kind of like a squirrel packing. And then it'll go and uh, store it for the winter and things like that. So that's really interesting to see how they can do that. So in terms of their habitat, I kind of showed a picture of the habitat they you would find them in. Um, it's kind of that forest edge uh, and throughout the city. So you can see them at parks and um, urban and suburban areas and neighborhoods. Um, and then you can typically find them near oak trees because again, uh, acorns are gonna be like kind of their favorite nut. Um, so throughout towns, outside of town, so pretty much all over. So in terms of conservation and threats, I kind of alluded to that a little bit. They're low concern. Like I said, they're so common, you can find them throughout. Um, but it's really interesting that it's only more so on the eastern part of the US. Uh, there's kind of a bleed over into the west. So uh, not seeing a blue jay in the west is really interesting because they're so common on this side of the US. Uh, so their populations have declined about 27% since 1966, which may sound like a lot, but their numbers are still, um, their breeding population is still going to be about 17 million. So yeah, they're pretty common. There's not much to worry about there. Um, and then so, uh, some of the threats, though, before I dive into the fun facts. So it's going to be like spring heat waves and then urbanization and city development and expansion is going to be what's affecting the Blue Jay. But then so diving into some fun facts. Um, so the, the pigment that they produce is actually melanin, which is gonna be like kind of that brown that you would see like with most uh, animals. Uh, so that the blue coloration that they have is actually from light being reflected back. So they don't actually produce a blue color. It's just the light reflecting in our eyes. So it's interesting that they're not actually really blue. Um, and then they're also known as forest paladins. So having that hawk call, um, they will let other birds know what's going on and protect the forest in that way. So uh, that is it for the blue jay. Let's dive into the next one. So this is kind of going to be the habitat that you'll find for here. This is going to be the migratory bird that we're talking about. So I'll go ahead and play. All right, so um, this one is gonna be, probably kidding. All right, so this one's gonna be a cerulean warbler, which is really interesting that they have a similar pattern to the blue jay. So their call is gonna be like a buzzy sound, a uh, song sound that extends to a buzzy trill. So it has like three buzzy notes at the first. So it's like doo 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 doo, and then that doo doo doo. And that's that four fast warbles at the very end. So that's kind of what you'll hear. Um, so it, that one's kind of, I'm still learning this one and trying to tease out uh, how this would be, uh, but I haven't really heard this one as much um, out in the field. So it's kind of unfortunate. I would love to hear one and love to see one. So that's gonna be the cer cerulean warbler that you're hearing if you get it. Um, so yeah, let's learn some more again. So diving into its life history, so they're found high in the can canopies and they hop around from tree to tree and from branch to branch looking for food. Um, and then they're female. So this what that I'm showing right now is actually a female. And they have that like dusk dusky hue of green in their um, coloration. So not necessarily as blue as the male. So it's really interesting. And then also uh, that's kind of cool. Their nests are uh, possibly built by female birds. And typically the, the nest building is shared by both sexes um, by birds or it's a male thing. So it's kind of interesting to see that these are nests built primarily by female. 
Um, and then in terms of the habitat, I kind of showed uh, the habitat, they're going to be more mature, deep forest hardwoods, uh, either in uplands or along the streams, and then deciduous forests along river valleys. Um, so that's kind of where you'll find them. So you won't necessarily find them in the city unless it's just a stopping point along the way to their or throughout their migration. But if you do, it'd be really cool. Um, so in terms of their diet, it's pretty simple what they eat. They eat insects, pretty straightforward. Uh, in terms of all warblers, they, I don't wanna say all, but most that I know of eat insects. Um, so now talking about their migration. So uh, here you can see at the bottom, this uh, light blue is gonna be their wintering range. So they'll travel down to uh, South America and they'll winter there. Um, and then the yellow is the migration path that they will take. And then sometimes they'll stop along the way in Central America or Mexico. But then uh, right in here, uh, particularly in Southeastern the US, and sometimes it gets a little bit more North, is gonna be their breeding grounds. And you'll typically find them there um, in the May to June, July area. And then towards early fall is when they'll travel back down uh, and they'll winter back in um, South America. So really interesting that they travel so far um, and can do this every single year. So um, in terms of their uh, conservation and threats, just bear with me because there's quite a bit, unfortunately. So uh, their uh, population is possibly threatened or endangered um, and their population has declined 70% uh, since 1966. So that's seven zero. So they've been decimated uh, by many things like uh, mining and mountaintop removal. So uh, they will breed uh, in the Appalachian region. So if we're uh, taking away the forest that they would breed in, that's less habitat for them to breed in, which can affect their uh, population numbers. And then also in terms of their migration, there's a lot of wind farms that they have to travel through to get up here. Um, and those wind farms can decimate these uh, animals as well. Um, but then also their nesting efforts uh, may fail because of parasitism by cowbirds. Um, they're also losing wintering habitat in South America. So it's not just breeding habitat, it's wintering habitat too. Um, there's wildfires, there's spring heat, heavy rainfall, urbanization and city uh, development, all the above that are affecting uh, these species, which is really unfortunate. But there are a lot of efforts being made to protect these species uh, along their migration here in the Appalachian region and down in South America. So it's really great. So lastly, diving into some fun facts. Um, it's pretty simple. So the first one, um, oop, the first one is that they use spider webs to uh, construct their nests, which is really interesting that they are small enough to grab a spider web and then weave it around to help form their nests, uh, which is really smart too. Um, and then also since they are found in so many different regions, of course they have names in different languages as well. So I only speak English on a good day, but in Spanish, they say Reinita Cerulea, and then in French, it's Periline Azure. So um, that is, my two birds for the day. So remember Cerulean Warbler and Blue Jay. And then um, that is my talk. Wonderful. Thank you so very much. We greatly appreciate that. And you yeah. know, I can't imagine, I mean, I've walked through a spider web before and, <laughs> ugh, you know, but, yeah. <laughs> but I can't yeah. imagine actually them being able to collect that enough to make a nest out of it. You know, that's, yeah. that's really neat. Yeah, uh, being a tall person, I am always catching all the spider webs <laughs> whenever I go on walks. So we let yeah. you go first. Right? Yeah, I need to let so, you yeah. go first. Yeah. I mean, even if I go second, I'll still catch some <laughs> that somebody didn't get. Yeah. Um, and then Billy, I saw that you put indigo bunting. Which I was guessing. Cool. Kai. <laughs> honestly, honestly, I I thought about using indigo bunting, um, but I ended up going cerulean warbler instead. And then for indigo bunting, uh, it's uh, the sound that they make is fire, fire, where, where, here, here, see it, see it. 
yeah um so it's, it is kind of similar to the cerulean warbler now that yeah. i think about it so you know and really I've, I've never heard cerulean warbler you know so thank you for sharing that and uh, you know i know like you had mentioned there are a lot of efforts um you know renee a future guest might be the appalachian mountain joint venture which is a group that's really working to try to improve their habitat throughout the region so um mm -hmm. ah, those are great man you got to keep those coming yeah. oh yeah all right yeah i don't know we'll see what color is next up i don't know i'm kind of making a list but yeah all right looking yes, forward why you got any why yeah blue yeah, and yeah. Right. <laughs> all, right. all right thank you <laughs> excuse me all right so moving on we are now going to uh be talking to chad nyman about some um, safety equipment so chad if you want to pull up your video there you are hi how are you hi, today? Renee. Hi, Billy. Doing well. How are you all doing today? Great. So I'm going to be talking today, uh, as you were mentioning, about woodland safety equipment, tools, and felling resources. Uh, just kind of a quick introduction and overview uh, to felling trees in the woods and some tools and, and different resources that are available out there. Uh, but before I jump into that, I just want to take a couple of minutes and introduce a few uh, forestry and natural resource students that are helping out uh, with a stave research drying project that uh, you all had uh, had me on to talk about a little while back. And so I'll just have them introduce themselves and talk about uh, why they selected their major. In addition to these forestry and natural resource students, there is one uh, animal science pre-vet student. And so these students, they're interning at Robinson Forest and at Robinson Center for Appalachian Resource Sustainability here, and they're engaging with some of the local counties mm -hmm. as well. And so they're getting a, a lot of experience throughout that extension network, working with wood science and forestry and agriculture. And so uh, without any more, I'll go ahead and let them introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tucker Brown. I am from Ashland, Kentucky originally. Um, I joined the forestry field because I wanted a career that put me outside working with my hands and working on my feet every day uh, in the surrounded by our forests. Um, my main interest in choosing this career is because I wanted to help sustainably manage our trees and conserve our woodland environments. Thank you. My name is uh, Holmes Lawson. I am from Berea. And uh, I got into forestry because in Berea, they have that big, uh, big forest there. And uh, through the extension services and all that, I found out about it. And it sounded like a really cool profession to get into. So that's what I chose it. Thank you. Great. I'm Emmy Bradley. Uh, I am originally from Lexington. And I got into forestry just because I love being outside. And I think that like the region that we're in right now, Kentucky is just a beautiful state. And I just want to like, you know, just work with it. And I love and enjoy it. So, yeah. Thank you. Our uh, vet science yeah, friend uh, but... is not going to say anything, but we're <laughs> grateful to have his assistance today. It sounds like you got a good team there, Chad. Absolutely. It's uh, really nice to have that help. We'll try to have them on in another show. <laughs> All right. So I am Chad Nyman. A lot of my Research and extension work is focused in on hardwood grading systems and markets, uh, different things relating directly to that, but working with the logging workforce and the sawmills uh, and just growing up around Kentucky, uh, chainsaws are a very useful tool, but one of those that uh, there is an enormous amount of danger involved in using them. And so wanted to provide just a little overview that uh, has safe felling practices, some of that personal protective equipment, and then additional resources to help you at, at whichever point you are, uh, whether you're just getting into thinking about getting a chainsaw or you've been cutting down trees for 30 years, there's always an opportunity to learn something about safe operation of chainsaws. So I gotta have a disclaimer. Uh, logging, you know, is the most dangerous occupation, according to the OSHA injury and fatality statistics. We know that uh, homeowners and farmers operating chainsaws on their property is uh, obviously a very dangerous thing to do, uh, things that you can do to do that much safer, uh, but there is inherent danger with felling and moving trees and logs. 
And it's one of the most dangerous activities that you can participate in. Uh, one of the statistics I saw said that about 36,000 injuries a year uh, across the country from chainsaws. So along those lines, there are a few different really important chainsaw resources that are available to you. Uh, one of those, uh, Hank Steltzer over in Missouri Extension has got a publication on selecting and maintaining a chainsaw. And so a lot of different uh, references that he has pulled into using uh, for that publication. And uh, so great resource there. It's really important that you read that manual that comes with your chainsaw. There's important maintenance information in there, as well as uh, safety precautions, things that you really need to read. And uh, I don't advocate for any particular brand of chainsaw, but there is one of the better safety videos out there is put together by Still, and uh, it has how to properly operate and maintain your chainsaw is the title of it. So it's a very encompassing program. And so I definitely recommend that. YouTube video. So when it comes to that chainsaw safety, uh, specifically focused on the chainsaw safety portion, there is a homeowner's uh, version from New York uh, Department of Health that uh, covers uh, some good information on, from the homeowner perspective, good practices to use. Uh, if you're more on the timber harvesting side of things, uh, there is from New Hampshire Cooperative Extension and their partners, uh, a resource there that gives some additional information on safe timber harvesting. And I've got one more resource there on working safely with a chainsaw from Indiana. And so Indiana Department of Natural Resources has put that together. So uh, abundance of resources out there to help you be safer and operate safer whenever you're felling trees. Um, it just takes some time to read those and to make sure you're getting good, credible uh, information. So the PPE, that personal protective equipment, and some of those tools that you really have to have when you're out there in the woods. Um, chaps is one of those that's very important. Um, you don't want to wait until you put a chainsaw far into your leg to become an advocate for chaps. Um, so it really is important to make sure you've got chaps that are rated for the type of activities you're doing, even if it's just a, a very brief job that you're going to be doing with the saw, you want to take the time to wear them. A lot of folks complain about being hot uh, while operating a saw and working in the summertime uh, in those chaps, but uh, you know, protecting your limbs is definitely more important. If you are in hot conditions, it's important to take time to stay hydrated and drink lots of water. Uh, but don't jeopardize your health uh, just for that reason. Hard hats are a very important one. Uh, so a lot of those injuries are happening to the head from limbs coming out of the tops of trees and uh, different objects that can strike. So even as that tree hits the ground, it can fling a top back towards you or different branches from that tree. And so having a hard hat to protect your head, um, there's different brands out there. We happen to have one of the highest quality brands made in Kentucky, um, which is the Bullard Hard Hat, which has a six point safety harness. And so uh, do your research on getting a hard hat. Make sure you get one that is going to uh, have a better outcome than another uh, by safety ratings and make sure you get one that, you know, is adjustable and comfortable so that you'll wear it more. You got to have leather gloves to protect your hands from sharp saws, and especially when filing or, or when handling that saw. You wanna wear leather boots that are gonna protect your feet, have good traction in the woods, a ax to be able to drive wedges. Wedges are those uh, plastic pieces here that are used for directionally felling that tree, as well as holding that tree in place, keeping it from settling back as the wood is removed. Uh, you've got saw scrunches and files to be able to tighten up the chain, loosen the chain, as well as sharpen those uh, teeth on that saw chain as well. I've got 
can took to be able to roll logs. It's not required, but it is nice to have that in the woods. I just, if you need to be able to move a log just a little bit, roll it off of something potentially, and a logger's tape to be able to measure the logs that you are going to be taking out of your woods. Uh, if you're going to be trying to determine length of that material or be able to sell some of that material, you want to have a way to measure it. So that equipment continues uh, with the PPE. So that hearing protection, you want to make sure that you've got protection that's going to actually protect from the decibels of that chainsaw. And so you want to be able to reduce that noise below 90 decibels for eight hours. That might require using two different versions of hearing protection, which could include earmuffs as well as earplugs. So you have to have a chainsaw that's going to meet your needs, depending upon what type of work you're doing. Uh, use different resources as well as talk to folks that uh, operate saws, have experience to be able to determine what's going to meet your needs. If you're going to be cutting a lot of trees, especially larger timber, it might not be a bad idea to have two saws with you in case one gets hung up. It can save you a lot of time and headache. And you want to have extra chainsaw chains just in case uh, that chain does get pinched and you need to be able to change it out to remain operating. So getting into the safe felling procedures, if you start looking around online uh, for safe felling resources and procedures, there's several different versions of a five-step safety uh, process, if you will. And so everyone's version that you look at is a little bit different, but they all encompass the same basic principles. And so the five steps that, as I was taught, uh, include hazard assessment initially. And so as you're walking up to that tree, you're observing any dead limbs. Uh, if it's a you know, broken top up in there that could be a widow maker, if there's grapevines uh, that are adjoining multiple treetops intertwined or limbs that intertwine those trees, any kind of icy, muddy, or wet conditions that you're going to be working in, steep terrain, and uh, if, if the tree that you're working with or nearby is a standing dead tree, as well as lodge trees. So, there's many different hazards and being able to identify those before you even think about how to cut down the tree helps to make sure that you're taking all that into account as you go into the further steps. And so with those standing dead trees, I just want to slow down and point out that they are extremely dangerous to cut due to those limbs falling, tops breaking out. Ash is a species that we have had a lot of mortality with due to emerald ash borer. And uh, the tops of those are, are well known for breaking out. Uh, and so quite dangerous if you're working with standing dead ash trees. But it's important to not drive wedges when felling a standing dead tree as it can snap that top off. And so if at all possible, you really wanna be able to use that tree's natural lean to your advantage. And let gravity take course. So following the progression, step two, you wanna measure that forward or back lean of the tree. And so using both of your index fingers, you wanna size up the canopy of the tree that you're going to fill. And so you'll bring both of your fingers together, meeting in the middle, and so wherever you end up meeting in the middle is where that canopy is located. And you can determine that divergence from the stem or the bowl of the tree. I've got some pictures. We have the natural resource students uh, that are in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources just went through their summer camp where their field season, if you will. And so part of that was going out in the woods and sizing up a tree, grading that tree, cutting that tree down, going through the bucking of logs, 
And then the grading of those logs, the sawing of that into lumber on a wood miser. So they got to go from the tree in the woods all the way through to sawed lumber and seeing the value added and understanding all of those different processes. And so we can see in this bottom image here, we've got John Reinstedtel, who is the forest manager at Robinson Forest, uh, giving a really good guide of how we determine that lean of that tree. And so you can see he's got his fingers, he's bringing them in, he's drawing them down, and he knows exactly where the weight of that tree is focused and how far off from the main stem of that tree that that lean is pushing. After that, step three, using that same index finger method, but you're gonna move your orientation about 45 degrees over to be able to see that side lean of that tree. And so how much that that crown is leaning to the left or the right. And so that gives that feller or person who is felling that tree uh, the ability to understand if they can use gravity to their advantage or if they have to compensate uh, to overcome that lean with wedging. And so once you understand where the gravity and the natural uh, direction that the tree wants to fall, then you come up with a tree felling plan. And so that's where you determine your direction of fell, the location that that tree is gonna be placed. You determine where you're gonna put that open face. And so I'll have an image to show what an open face looks like. I advise always using an open face cut. And so you're gonna determine the width of that hinge, that holding wood, and the length of that hinge. And so here is that image of that face cut, that open face. And so that is gonna determine the direction that that tree is going to go. And as the, as the feller puts this cut in, they'll then come in behind that open face cut and they'll leave a certain amount of hinge determined by the diameter of the tree. And they'll do a plunge cut behind that, removing the wood behind it. And then the tree will fall forward towards this face. And so you can see, this is where A here is where the face cut goes in. Here B is the hinge wood that allows that tree to be able to slowly come down and control the direction and, and have a lot more control of that tree. Whereas if there was no hinge wood, then that tree would be able to go backwards or sideways in a certain direction, whereas we can fell it going towards that open face using that hinge. And then, so before you actually do any cutting or put any face cut in, you know, you've determined that plan in step four. Step five, before you do any cutting, is determine your escape routes. And so these are critically important. We know that a significant amount of the injuries from felling trees happens right behind the stump. And so you want to get at least 20 foot away from that stump at a minimum. And so you have your, your primary escape route, your optimal escape route, if you will. And so that should be away from the lean or hazard side of your tree. And that's roughly 45 degrees from the base of that tree in the direction opposite of the felling. And so this image here explains what I was just saying there. And so here is the tree, the felling direction going this way, and you can see your safety zone escape route A and escape route B, minimum of 20 feet. If, uh, if there's some tree that you can get behind, uh, that's not a bad idea. Use what you have to make sure that you have a safe place to escape to in the event that that tree would go in the wrong direction or if the top was to get flung back towards you or any limbs or other materials that are previously part of that tree. And so 
just some considerations before you're felling. I know some folks uh, will have different objectives. Some might be landowners just wanting to learn more about, you know, cutting down one tree or a few trees, and some other folks might want to, you know, go through and be much more involved on their land and, and maybe, you know, are thinking about cutting hundreds of trees or harvesting some timber. And so anytime before you do felling, you want to consider what your management objectives are. You want to, if you're trying to long-term manage your woods, you want to work with forestry and wildlife resource professionals, be able to develop that management plan or your management goals. You really want to decide which trees you're going to cut and uh, how that is going to help you meet your management objectives. And then what will you do with the material that you cut? Are you going to cut it for firewood? Are you going to saw it into your own lumber with a bandsaw mill that you purchased? Or, or are you going to sell logs to a sawmill? Are you just going to leave this material on the ground? And so you got a variety of different options there. So if you're going to sell material, you have to think about how you're going to transport it to the markets, what lengths and grades and specs of those logs, and especially the pricing that they're willing to pay uh, for bringing that material to them. All very important considerations to think about and have in place before you actually fell any trees. Really briefly, I just want to mention the Kentucky Forest Conservation Act. This under KRS 149 requires all logging businesses to follow appropriate BMPs for water protection, have a master logger on site while the job is active. Private landowners harvesting their own property are exempt from the Kentucky master logger requirement, but they must have an ag water quality plan for any property that's over 10 acres. And so private landowners are still responsible for water quality violations occurring on their property. As such, I've got a link here for the Kentucky Logging BMP Field Guide. And so that'll provide resources and how to uh, responsibly manage those best management practices for water protection pertaining to skid and haul roads and forest settings. And so I've got that there. And just, I wanna mention that if you, you know, if you get looking at this information, you're thinking about harvesting your woods, if uh, you're looking for a master logger, there is a Kentucky master logger website. And so I wanna make sure that you all know that that resource is available. And uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, if you're gonna sell logs, just a reminder to really consider the bucking of those logs, those lengths and grades and, and how to scale those logs. And so when they're scaling, they're scaling to the, down to the nearest whole foot. So a log that's 16 foot, six inches, that would be a 16 foot log. And uh, a lot of mills will ask that that logger or person bringing those logs will leave at least two to three inches of what they call over length or trim allowance. And so knowing what those requirements are and working with those mills, if you have interest in selling logs and uh, being able to measure your average diameter on that small end of that log to be able to have some idea for footage. And, uh, and so those are all important if you are going to be selling some of that material and things to consider. It, it's on the far end of felling safety, but if you're gonna be thinking about felling trees on your property, you wanna try to think about it long-term. Uh, that's all that I've got. All right. Well, thank you, Chad. We greatly appreciate that. You know, we had someone mention, don't forget a first aid kit. That could be a, a good thing to just have in your vehicle as well. Absolutely. It's those no matter things. what you're doing. <laughs> right. We, we kind of take those things for granted and just assume that everyone else is just thinking, of course, I'm going to have a first aid kit out there. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I appreciate that a lot because that is a, a critically important item to have especially, you know, to be able to triage uh, if there was a serious situation. Mm -hmm. right. so always have first aid kits, always yeah. have a way of communicating with folks if you'll be out in your woods or at least mm -hmm. let them know, you know, there's so many things to safety. And uh, I always know that I'm missing something <laughs> when I <laughs> talk to you about it. And so thank you for pointing that out. Well, no, I think it's good to focus on that. You know, we want you to live to find another day, right? <laughs> exactly.
Well, thank you, Chad. We appreciate your presentation. Yeah, and, and, and keep those interns when I'm working well for you there. There you go. <laughs> we'll have them on again at another yeah. time. Yeah, all right. Thanks, Chad. All right. Well, Billy, you know, Forest Street Extension, they gear up we gear up a lot in the summertime. We do, we do. And we've got a few programs that I was gonna to try to kind of cover real quickly for the group. Um, these are programs that are gonna be running through June through August, and there may be some additional ones coming online, but these are what we have on the books right now. You can find all of our programs on our calendar page, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, but let's start first with um, one from one of our partners, the Rough Grouse Society, which we partner with on a number of different events, has a, an upcoming webinar are on June 7th. And this is a topic a lot of people have a lot of interest in, Renee, is prescribed fire and how fire can be used to kind of manipulate habitat and help some of these wildlife species, including rough grouse. So on June 7th, this is a free webinar. It's only a couple of hours and there's a link to register. And this is really for anybody that's interested in wildfires and how that may be used for forest and wildlife management. So I encourage you to check that out. Um, there is a link for that on there. And then um, Jacob Mullen, our very own Dr. Muller is going to be having a workshop and this is really a kind of a multi-part workshop. The first part is on July 12th and it's an adaptation planning and practices for Kentucky Forests. I think we all recognize that the climate is changing and we're going to have to change the way we manage and, and work with our forests. So Jacob is leading a segment on July 12th that is open um, to the public. That's an all-day webinar and there's a series of presenters on that and again that one's open to the public. And then just for forest or forest man or land managers. These are the people that are actually managing land. This is on July 20th and 21st, and these are in-person workshops. And they're going to be um, both at um, Quicksand or um, Jackson, Kentucky, down at our Robinson Center for Appalachian Resource Sustainability, as well as at Penny Ryle State Forest. So if you've got any questions about those, especially if you're interested in the workshop on July 20th or 21st, please contact Dr. Jacob Muller on that one. Um, and then our flagship program that we do for our woodland owners here in the state that includes many, many partners from the Kentucky Woodland Owners Association to Kentucky Department of um, Fish and Wildlife Resources, Kentucky Division of Forestry, NRCS, and many more is our 2022 Kentucky Woodland Owner Short Course. We have those dates on the books now, and those programs are planned, so we'll encourage folks to register as soon as they can. I will let you know that, um, unfortunately, because of limitations on space at some of our facilities, the two field tours are going to be limited to 60 people, so if that's something you want to uh, participate in, I would encourage you to register early. So, But we are going to start the series off on July 9th. 19th um, with a series of online sessions. These are going to be Zoom sessions and webinar sessions in the evenings, and they're going to be 6.30 or 7 to 8.30. And the first one on July 19th, woodland management activities. I mean, how you can get started managing your woods and some of the things that all um, that are interested in managing your woodlands should do, as well as tree identification, an ever popular topic. Mm -hmm. and then, uh, Dr. Crocker is going to be doing um, forest health on July 21st. And then um, we're going to have Dr. Matt Springer doing wildlife management on, on July 26th. And then Dr. Jacob Muller on woodland management and changing climate on the 28th. And then on August 6th, we're going to be down at Penny Ryle State Forest. And I will say this one will be much more kind of a driving tour. Um, some of the work is spread out on the property. So we'll be basically um, piling into cars and driving to these different locations, touring some of these management practices. Um, and then on August 13th at Berea College Forest, this is going to be more of a walking tour. So you probably um, plan to walk at least two miles that day. Um, but Berea College Forest has a great um, forestry outreach center and they're a great partner of ours and they're um, hosting our event that day and they've got some great trails right off of that center that leads to a lot of management work that they've been doing. So we're going to be checking that out. So again, I'll encourage you if you're interested in the field tours um, to register early and you can get all the webinars um, separately as a separate registration. So um, please um, check that out when you can. And then I'll wrap up real quick with our From the Woods Today show, um, our June lineup. We're going to have sustainable oak practice, uh, oak management practices on, on June 1st. And then unfortunately, we're going to be talking about spotted lanternfly, Renee. This is yeah. one 
Dr. Crocker kind of previewed for us, and she's actually got an article coming out um, with Dr. Um, Larson on this um, species in our Kentucky Woodlands Magazine. And then on um, the 15th of June, we're going to have Dr. John Cox talking about coyotes. Um, it's a pretty interesting subject, and we get a lot of um, interest in that topic. Mm -hmm. and then on the 22nd of June, we're going to have pollinators. So we've got a great lineup of programs, whether they're virtual, and um, whether they're in person, um, or they're just on this show. Um, we right. encourage you all to participate and let others know about it, please. You know, there's a lot of people out there that we think could benefit not only from on From the Woods Today programming, but some of these other education program. So please um, help us spread the word. And like Dr. Crocker was saying, you know, um, you can help make a difference. You really can. So you definitely can. So, you know, we had a really packed show today and a lot of great information. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, we are, we are done for today and, you know, we always look forward to your comments. You can always watch any of the shows on fromthewoodstoday.com and you can see all of our information there. Yeah, no doubt. And if you have something you want to see on a future episode, let us know. We have a little survey that you can complete. So, Okay, sounds great. All right. Well, until then, take care and we will see you next Wednesday at 11 o'clock. Bye. Bye, everyone. From the woods today.